Okay, okay. Well, welcome. well, welcome. So, so I, think I think we're live in multiple, in places, multiple here. places here. Uh, Facebook, uh, live, Facebook Live, YouTube, YouTube live, live, and more. And more. So, so, Sean Pratt is Sean here Pratt with us today. So, today. so we're, so ex we're extremely, extremely excited to have him. And now <laughs> we're going to check and verify <laughs> volume here. Uh, uh, Mr. Heller, can you say hello? <laughs> All right. And Mr. Pratt, can you say hello so that we can verify that people can hear you? Yes. Uh, this is uh, Sean Pratt here. Can't wait to chat with my dear friend. Uh, I could say rude things here, but just Johnny Heller. <laughs> and, okay. And so for, from the tech point of view, let's see, I just turned down one thing. I'm looking at another and I'm, tr I'm looking for where we have a echo going on. <laughs> Nobody has said that to me before. So what I'm going to do, I'm take off. Hey, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, you know, it happens to everybody eventually. Okay, so Todd, uh, so some of us says the echo is gone. Okay, echo is gone, echo is gone is what I'm, what I'm I doing. I guess it's be on our end, so, okay. Okay. <laughs> no, it, the internet is run by the Pony Express here in Oklahoma. So Heller so said- it's a little they're slower. Saying, they're saying no Heller audio, so we're gonna, what are, what's, uh, which mic are you on there, Mr. Hell? Oh, it's saying you're on your webcam audio. Let's, uh, let me see if I can switch that. Yep, yep. Hold on. I, well, I, hold on. Stand by, please. I, they let me, this, uh, Mr. Heller, try talking again. No, I've, it switched over. I switched it. It's your regular mic. So can we get a comment in the comments? Do we hear Johnny at all? Oh, I see. I can get out and come in again, I suppose. No, let's try this now. I'll bet he's... Okay. They're not hearing me. Okay, can, you, can you well, that, hear me now? That's, that's by design, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's no, they can't hear me. That's... Okay, hold on. Hold on. Oh, on. no. Oh, oh no! Oh, there I'm back. Am I back now? I said a lot of funny things is. a minute ago, and y'all you missed them all. <laughs> You're golden. You were killing it. Oh, you were killing it. Some yeah. of my best yeah. stuff. I, I had a tight three minutes there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Johnny will ask you up on the uh, couch, John. Yeah. You know, back in the old days. Uh, Okay, okay, so, so it sounds like we're, sounds back. Like we're back. back. Everybody says Everybody that you're, says back. That you're back. back. So, so okay. Johnny, so Johnny uh, wait, uh, wait, start that again. Ta that tell again. us Talk about, about uh, Mr. Pratt Mr. here. Pratt. Okay, Mr. Pratt has done um, got over a thousand books. He's known for his uh, nonfiction work, but he's sterling at fiction as well. He's um, he, in, in all honesty, he's one of my. I, I respect him as a uh, as a wonderful actor, wonderful narrator. Um, I love him as a friend. He's one of my best friends. He and I have traveled the globe together doing audiobook workshops. And um, <laughs> we get more things. Don, we're hearing you in duplicate. Well, Don can play with that. Um, uh, the echo comes in Don's. Anyway, to go back to Sean Pratt's intro, which has nothing to do with Don's echo. <laughs> um, yeah, Sean is just, he's, he's a, a dream to work with. Um, one of the things I really like about working with him is he and I are completely different in our styles, but the same end game. Um, Sean has, if you come across an issue in your narration, in your performance, and you have some questions, Sean has like a list of things for that specific issue. You know, these 17 things, fix that. These 18 things, and it's all written down. It's got everything. I simply can't do that. I, I don't have that, uh, I, I can't, do, my mind doesn't work like that. So it's fun to work with him because his does. And so together we really, um, uh, my weak areas are strengthened by his strength and vice versa. And, uh, and also, I, I, he's a, he's a, you, <laughs> when you hear him speak and you look at him, you may not believe it, but he's really not a bad guy at all. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and, and Sean, and, and I guess that's it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next time. Yeah, he was um, saying, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> so I'm going to check. Can people hear me? Am I still echoing here? 
Uh, let's see. So, uh, my, it, so Todd says my audio is echoing. So first thing, I'm going to ask a question, though, Sean. Here's one, of the th and then that way I'll just get out of the way even if I'm echoing and, and uh, Johnny can, can handle this here. But here's my question for you. Most people think that, that nonfiction, which you kind of sometimes have said you're pretty good at, from what I understand, people think, oh, I'm not a good actor, so I'm just going to do nonfiction because it's easy and nobody, nobody, so anybody, Don could read nonfiction, uh, but no, I get the sense that you don't take it that way. What do you think about nonfiction versus fiction? And I mean, isn't it easy? Who, you're not really doing anything, you're just reading, right? No, I'm just reading. I, I phone it in every day, pretty much. <laughs> It's like once I discovered I could just phone in nonfiction, I've like, man, my career is set. <laughs> uh, but then I decided, you know, it's maybe time to up my game a little bit. I'll do a little bit of acting. Um, this is also, it's funny, this, this, this question also becomes prescient. We'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it later when we talk about artificial intelligence and, you know, text to speech, because I've seen comments online where they say, well, I'm not worried about AI taking my job as a narrator because I do fiction. It'll take away all the nonfiction stuff. And the truth of the matter is, is there's a lot of acting in nonfiction. And one of the reasons I was so drawn to it to begin with, well, the first reason I was drawn to it was I needed more work. <laughs> you know, I was, it's, uh, I started narrating back in the ancient, in the, in the late 1900s, as they say now, uh, of 1996. But by 98, after having done it for about two years, I, I was getting out of theater and I wanted to go full time and I wanted to get in. I, so I called my clients up like Blackstone and Books on Tape and I said, I'll narrate anything that nobody else wants. I don't care what it is. I need to work. And so they took me up on it by sending me nonfiction. But because I was still the new guy, they were sending me like B-list titles and these things ran 10, 20, 30 hours long. But what I discovered immediately was this sort of paradigm shift. I realized I wasn't just reading the text. It was literally having a chance to do a one man show. And so that's where I came up with the idea of what I call my TED talk idea, where I am the character of the author in a certain specific location, talking to a specific audience that is interested in the topic. And then what that does is it turns the text into a script. So it's, it's like, well, it is. It's like doing a one-man show for six to ten hours, depending on the length of the piece. And what I like about it is the challenge of coming up with different ways of, you know, as the author explains their topic, the topic of the book, and wants to share their knowledge, they have an opinion about it, and they have a feeling. And so what I like about doing nonfiction is the detective work involved in the text analysis to find out how do they feel and then add that on top of my read so yeah there's a whole lot of acting involved and it's no different you know right now i'm doing an agatha christie mystery an hercule poirot piece so what am i doing i'm reading the lines in the character looking for little moments where i can add a little flair to the read so you learn more about how the character feels what they're saying you know and the same applies for nonfiction. and in fact i think for the challenges involved it's even more challenging because it's just me. I don't, there's, there's no, you know, you don't have character voices and zombies and love scenes. It's just me trying to communicate and sustain this performance. So no, there's, it's a, it's quite the misnomer. And yeah, it, it's a, uh, I carry a soapbox around in case I have to throw it down and jump up on it on a moment's notice when I hear people talk about that. I, I've always discussed this with you and we present it in our, in our workshops and Sean and I work together with generally bring a, Sometimes Joanna Perrin, sometimes Anna Clement, but generally, um, I'll do the first day, of, and I'll I'll be the head guy for the fiction day, and Sean for the nonfiction. And I think if you add it up, we've probably done the same number of both genres when you think about it. Because um, I started in the early '90s as well. But when we discuss this, I my view on fiction, nonfiction rather, is the actor needs to find something that's playable for the actor. Mm -hmm. And in my in, and I'll do a Paul Rubin. I would say the following, um, <laughs> <laughs> that what is playable is the author's passion for the topic. Because when you get a nonfiction book, the, the, the history of, 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 of glasses, eyeglasses, it's not necessarily interesting to you, but it is to those who, who like it. 
and who find who are curious how they're made and how did it start and what you know, all the history goes into it. Some books aren't your particular cup of tea, but the actor needs to remember that it's not for it's it's not. I didn't write it for Sean. I wrote it for people who wear eyeglasses, and you got to find you, the actor, Sean, Johnny, everybody out there, needs to find and play the passion the author has for the topic. Granted, if, 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 there's, if it's a topic you're interested in as well, it's much easier to play, but you know, there is acting involved in all of this. We have said, I have said, and Sean has said, and everybody, I, everybody who I, I give a rat's ass about has said, it's an acting job, it's an acting job, it's an acting job, first and foremost, and it doesn't matter if it's fiction or nonfiction. And let me let me ask something else, Sean. Let me ask about because because you have a different style too. Uh, we had Joel on uh, last week. Joel Frumkin who does a, uh, I think it's a fifteen week course or something. Mm -hmm. You also while you everybody does one on ones, but you do a long term course. Right. Uh, how is that designed? And if I'm to take it, do I take my first term? Then is there a second and a third term? Is it like a, um, is it a three year program or is it a 50 year yeah. study with the master. <laughs> One as an artist is always learning and growing, you see. Um, <laughs> Put out your ass. Yeah, right. So, no, so, you know, when I was, I started coaching actors on the business of show business. This is way even before, uh, well, I, I started doing that around the same time I started narrating books. So I didn't actually do audiobook related coaching for you know, quite some time. And I taught actors the business of show business. So I'd go to colleges and universities and actor groups up and down the East Coast and, you know, talk about agents and headshots and, you know, promotional stuff and things like that. And then that led over, I kept getting, and then I started doing audiobook workshops on my own based out of Washington, D.C., where I was living at the time. And um, I would do a workshop where I would do the technique and then I'd bring in an engineer that would talk about how to put together your studio or something like that. And I, every time I did a workshop, someone would eventually say, do you coach? And I kept saying no, because at that time I was doing a book a week. Yeah. I was narrating a book a week. And yeah, I just stopped some people. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and ironically, I was in Johnny's hometown of Chicago doing a thing for the AFTRA for the union on audiobooks, And we packed the room. There must have been 60, 70 people in the space. And at the end, I had like 10 people come up to me and I thought, you know what? They asked, do you do coaching? And I said, I thought about it. I said, you know, this, the universe is telling me something here. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll give it a go. And so I did some research. I looked around on the web, who did what? And, you know, uh, talked with a lot of people. And initially I started out as a tactical coach for any kind of narration. And tactical coaching is where you get feedback right in the moment when you're performing like when you go let's say you go to one of johnny uh johnny uh in mind workshops and you come up to read we're going to give you instant feedback that's tactical coaching and i did that for a little while but i realized i, I it wasn't quite satisfying enough i and and i saw that there were a lot of other tactical coaches out there who did fiction and did audiobooks and so my dad always said don't try to be better than the other guy try to be different and so as a business decision, I decided I was going to teach nonfiction because nobody was teaching it. And I wanted to add in a business track to teach my students how to do it. And I realized that was far too complex to teach in the moment, as it were. And so I did a lot of sort of soul searching and realized I need to build a program that I would want to go to. You know, so I wasn't pandering to an audience. I'm like, this is what I have to offer. This is what makes me excited. And so I built this curriculum. And right now it's it's 14 lessons. And we meet one basically every three to four weeks, my students. So you're committing to working with me for at least a year. Ah, see, and, a long time to answer that question, Mr. Politician. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get a little pre, I had to warm up, get a good preamble. So do you find people when they work with you take, um, treat you a little better because they know you grew up as a redhead? <laughs> they take pity on me. Yeah. They take pity on me pretty much. Yeah. I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. So, on. yeah. So I, you know, I built a program that appealed to me. Yeah. And I'm very, as Johnny will testify, I'm a very type A personality, which is why I have the five things of this and the three things of that. And, 
you know, the steps involved with this, A, B, C, and D. And that's just, and once again, this, this is why when Johnny and I teach, we have such a good time because we are so fundamentally different in our approach. Um, I, you know, if we were, I, I, he's sort of the William Shatner to my Spock of audiobook coaching workshops. I'm thinking he's like, die. He's like in the moment, he's passionate. He's rock doing his thing. And I'm sort of off in the corner with my, you know, my ears are growing into the points doing my thing. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a, it's a curriculum base. And so there's assignments on narration and there's, there's written work and things. And that appeals to me. That's the, those are the kinds of classes I liked in college. And in fact, those are also the acting classes. When I was a New York actor, you know, I liked going to a, a set acting class. And so, and then to, to build on your class, uh, your, you, you, part of your question, no, when they graduate, they graduate. That's it. There is no like, okay, now you can enroll for the super duper extra yes. secret stuff. You know, no, I, I, I make a point of selling them. Like by the time a student graduates, they have all the tools that I use in my own career every day. There's nothing I've held back, you know, and I, in fact, frankly, I want them to get the hell out because I need to make room for new <laughs> students to come in because yeah. I only have the limits, you know, I'm up to about a hundred students. And I can only take on new students when I have more that, you know, leave for whatever reason. I'm the same way I, with banks, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, it's, it's built the way I, that appeals to my person. And ironically, a lot of people who like nonfiction are also very type A uh, kinds of people, and they like structure as well. So I didn't know any of that when I started. It just was serendipity that it sort of connected up that way. So I have a question here about the new students. So somebody comes in brand new and they don't, they're, they're, what's the biggest mistake you see people making at the startup if they've only been doing this a year? I'm going to call them still a startup if they're only a year into it, but th that could be disputed. But what, what do you see as people, if they're joining, what's the biggest things that they're missing these days? Well, it's always the business side. And that's usually why they, a lot of them come to me. They've heard that I have a business track. And I, I tell people all the time, and Johnny can testify to this too, you know, you can be a really talented performer, but if you can't master the business side of whether you're a stand-up comic or a theater actor or an audiobook narrator, if you don't understand the business side of it and what that actually entails, the grind of it, which is which is frankly your your real job as a performer, you know, there you're gonna get stuck in ACX purgatory. And so I, a lot of people come to me because they have either taken other classes that were helping them answer that question or they like nonfiction. Oh, and he also does the business side as well. But it's always it, the vast majority, Don, come to me because they're frustrated, you know, they with the business side. And they, you know, how do I get to the big publishers? I'm like, you know, it's like that ACDC song. It's, there's a... It's, you know, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. You got to hang in there a long time. You've got there's a lot of nuance beyond just your natural storytelling ability, although that is fundamental. But you can be a great storyteller. But if you if you don't have the technique or the system down to follow up with people, or to go hunt down work, or understanding the value of social media, or saving your money up to go to a workshop like Johnny Splendiferous thing, or or you know, or Joel's Cruise, or whatever, or or a professional thing like APAC. Those are all part and parcel of the business side. Wait, wait there's a it. people aspect of this business. I don't understand. <laughs> you, uh, no, but yeah. let me let me let me put. So my summary, because Johnny and I talk about this all the time, and it always comes back down to the same thing: where, hey, I could be the greatest voiceover artist in the world, but if I don't get along with people, and if I don't have my act together in terms of systems to manage the processes that are the real, we'll just call them the pain points for most people. Then mm. they don't do they they. My mom told me I have a great voice. Doesn't seem to make me a great voiceover artist in terms of from a publisher point of view. Is that close? Yeah, and I can't imagine your mom ever saying that to you, but I'll go with it for now. <laughs> um, yeah, you know the, the 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 they also they they. I have a lot of students come to me from a small C corporate background. And they're desperate to narrate audiobooks, but they've only known the world where they show up at work and someone tells them what to do. And I had, and that's not the freelancer lifestyle. You know, the freelancer lifestyle is all self-motivated. It's what I call the hustle and the grind. You gotta be excited, that's the hustle part. You have to be excited when your feet hit the floor every day 
to go, wow, maybe there's an audition here. Can I follow up with so-and-so? Hey, I'm going to go, you know, uh, go on to make this post on social media. And that's the fun part because it's you broadcasting and sending out stuff, that good energy of what you do. The, and you need those little wins, you know, like literally right before we were talking, guys, you know, I got a couple emails back from some projects I'm in the process of negotiating with authors privately. And those are little wins, as I call it. And that provides the fuel in the tank for the grind. And the grind is where nobody wants to do the fucking grind, right? Yeah. That's the that's the invoicing and the following up and the, the tracking down the, the, you know, the author or tracking down the audition or having, to, you know, it's all the, mainly it's the administrative work, right? Hey, hey, but for, hey. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I'm going to oh, butt in here. Before we started, you and I were talking offline, and you mentioned that you had yesterday talked to some people, and instantly, the day after, they all call you because they want you now. Is that correct? I think you said well, something about it took a year and a half. How long? You said- Oh, yeah. So I, I had, so to, so to clarify, I, about a year and a half ago, I had two different authors I was speaking with. One, I had just done a short- project for him. And he said, Hey, I'm going to be working on my next book. I'll call you when it's ready. And then the other guy, um, I had approached through a colleague who'd given me his name. And he said, Well, I've already got a narrator nailed down for this book. I'm starting my next one. I'll get in touch with you. And damned if they don't both didn't get a hold of me last week. At the how same long time. was the lead time on that? A year and a half, a year and a half. So Johnny is has mentioned that same sort of thing. How long Johnny? So are you two both auditioning occasionally? Do you, Sean, do you still end up occasionally auditioning for something or is it just all magic that shows up and you don't do anything and, it, and, the, and the, the heavens are opening up? The answer is yes to both. Um, well, you know, if you, here's the thing. Johnny and I, and you know, like Hillary Huber or whoever you might think, we still audition for stuff and we still sometimes don't get it either. Let's just be clear about that. You know, especially when you have the author making the final call, the the casting director might be go Johnny's the obvious get for this, but the author goes, no, I like this other guy better, you know. And there's nothing you can do about that. That's just the game. So we still audition for projects. In fact, I got one from Podium just now. I mean, three minutes before we started, an audition for a project. Yes, I'll do it. I mean, I'll audition for it, and maybe I'll get it. Maybe I won't. Um, but, you know, you hang in there long enough. And if you work the hustle and the grind back and forth, you build a client base. Uh, you, you raise your in, you know, you raise your profile in the industry through social media and events. And of course, you have a body of work that people listen to. And that's when things start falling out of the sky. Because I once again, last week was also there was a trifecta. I have a gentleman who's a pastor, uh, I think, in Illinois. He He's heard a number of Christian audio books I've done. And he said, I've got these other little books by this same author that I've always wanted to have done on audio. Can we talk about a project? So, you know, you when you build that body of work and you make yourself accessible through social media so people can find you, you know, and then out of the blue, you know, I'm looking at four or five books with this guy next year. Yeah. So there's it's, it, it, it becomes both. The longer you stay in the game, the more stuff happens. We've gone a really long time without me saying anything. I don't want that to happen again. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, I'll say. I'll say. Part, part of the uh, the marketing said so people. A lot of people are are conditioned by society, their upbringing, what they perceive that actors are just actors, and suddenly there's just work all over the place. Right. And and they they want those moments where you're actually in performance in the audiobook industry. There's a lot of those moments of performance. A book can be very long, but to get there can take some work. And I think that part of the job is rarely discussed. I think, as Sean mentioned, people expect an immediate response to everything. When I contact, I just sent a letter. I haven't heard from Tantor. Gosh, I work for them constantly. I only worked like twice this year, which is unusual. That happens. So I send them a note. What's going on? What's that? No, they may not even respond. I have no idea. I have no, and, and what do I do if they don't? Well, I'll send them to something else. One of the things I'm learning when uh, uh, I know that Don mentions that I coach all, I try to get coaching. I'm trying to learn the best ways to get hold of people who I don't know yet because a lot of casting people, they move on, they do other things. So I'm meeting new casting people. 
Um, how do you do that? Well, there's the APA where you got to join to get in their speed dating. You can do uh, PG Auckland, Dion Audio, master classes. You can, there's a million ways to meet things. Are some of those pay to play? By definition, absolutely. Does that make them wrong? I don't know. <laughs> At least you get to meet people. Mm-hmm. One of the things you do when you, you've got to find a way to meet these people, you've got to find a, uh, a method, a technique that works for you that makes sense in the marketing world. I know a lot of the uh, newer narrators, not necessarily younger, but necessarily newer, seem to be doing like a lot of TikTok things. Is that effective? Yes, if they're reaching an audience that likes TikTok. I know for a fact, Sean mentioned that, let's say Sean, Johnny, and and uh, let's see who's out there, I, uh, Dom. I don't know who Dom is, so no offense, Dom. I don't know, I'm, I'm just gonna throw your name out, okay? Don't Don't be offended. But let's say we three are up for the same book and the casting director generally picks three to five people. And they say, now the author has a lot of pulls. Here's what happens. The author says, you know, the really best person for this, because there's a lot of uh, mention of carpentry and and wood. Sean has done that for a living. He knows that stuff. Johnny can find the human, but Sean is probably my first choice. Then maybe Johnny for the experience. And this guy, Dom, I think is pretty good, but I would go for the first two. And the author looks things over and checks it out and gets back because you're right. Sean mm-hmm. is right. And Johnny sounds good. But Dom is 140 million followers on TikTok. That may, if that makes a difference to the author, and it might, mm-hmm. it could easily, that's who gets the book. Does that mean you should go out and get 140 million followers? Well, you, yes, you can't because you're <laughs> not nuts anymore. But if you can get a big following, that can help with certain authors who give a rat's ass about that kind of thing. Sometimes you you have absolutely, and Sean and I will promise you, absolutely no control of how the author perceives your voice, your audition, or what happens after you've auditioned. Your only job as an actor is to do the best you can and to find opportunities to get the auditions. Unless the money is not where I want it to be, I never turn down an audition. Well, that's, I mean, obviously it's a book I don't want to do. <coughs> I got I got called for a book, and I'm not going to go into details about it because I'm not supposed to, um, by an author who wants me to do the book. And it's absolutely antithetical to my particular beliefs on a given topic. Yet, I'm going to do it because I'm an actor. Because my, my feeling on this is if I, if I play Hitler in a, in a motion picture and do a great job, doesn't mean I'm a Nazi. Just right. means I'm a good actor, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you, it, yeah. so I, I think that <coughs> I think that you have to um, you have to make some of your own opportunities. Um, you have to you have to be willing to audition, willing to be out there. And if it if if it's Sean and me and Scott Brick and, uh, and and people I don't even know, I don't know who else is in the in the mix. I have no idea. Yeah, I know you never know. things I've been tight for that I haven't gotten that I wanted. I can't, yeah. all you can do is, I'm sorry. And sometimes you'll be happily surprised. Sean waits a year and a half and authors call him. I, I did a series of books where a fellow, charming, charming, I really liked the books. Got a call, I think I may, I don't remember if I mentioned this or not. I don't wanna be, I don't wanna mention names, but this author gets hold of me and says, listen, these, I've got some more stuff coming out. You're gonna be the guy. And my success has been because of you. So I'm gonna send you a percentage of my royalties every quarter. Sean yeah. sends me royalties now, so I'm I we're in the same same sort of situation. Uh, well, he, he does that to me too, but we call them friendship fees. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Because otherwise, he wouldn't have any friends if he didn't send. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's ridiculously <laughs> expensive to keep the two of you around. I can tell John, you right Sean has a hundred students because twenty of them are needed to pay off John and me. <laughs> but so you know, there's. What do you see people doing right, though? So if you have somebody new, so we just we talked about uh, they don't understand that the, that it's a business. They don't understand. I mean, this is over and over again. People mm-hmm. think it's all about the voice, and they don't understand there's a business side. There's a personal relationship side. And that some of that doesn't happen overnight. I think you and I and Johnny crossed paths for three, four, five years before we became, you know, I mean, we would talk occasionally, but then it changes over the years. Some people are short-term about this whole thing and don't realize that a lot of the relationships and people doing really well have been doing this a while. But what are you seeing that people are doing right when they start with you that you're kind of like, ah, oh, cool, that really works well? 
compared to the other people that are not booking work? Well, one of the things I see is that they're willing to do the grind. They're willing to audition every day and they understand. It's something that I tell my new students, right? For a newbie, you need experience more than you need money. And I'm very upfront with a lot of the new, new students. I'm like, look, you're not going to make any real money for the first year. It's just, you know, you could always be wrong, but the statistics and experience show the first year is about getting experience and credits on your resume. Every book they do, they're going to learn a heap about audiobook technique and um, uh, just the lifestyle of being a narrator. So the ones that come to me who are doing something right, they're not hyper focused on the per finished hour jobs on ACX. They'll take interesting projects or they'll take anything they can get just for the experience. I mean, Johnny and I could probably talk for hours on all the you know initial lousy acting gigs we did for free or for subway money, but you did it because you had the connection, you had the credit on the resume, you, you, you know, uh, you met those people at the networking event and you got to perform. You know, the, the, the performance part is the, uh, is the icing on the cake. The, your job as a freelancer is auditioning. That's the job and everything connected to it. So you can say being on TikTok is, is part of auditioning because you are putting yourself out there to let people know you're around. Um, you know, promoting the work you do, tagging people on social media, going to events, whether in person or virtual. And the ones that come to me that are doing stuff right are starting to do that immediately. They, and they've also come from a business background where they saw how it worked, if you know what I mean. So they're taking the same principle. Sean says something that makes me think of two quick things, and then I want to see if we get questions from our audience. But the first thing is, one of the things I think I find some people doing right is I've got, this week alone, I've had two different uh, actors, students. Um, I, I didn't say my students, because a lot of these people study with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I can't stand when a, an actor gets an award and a coach or another says, oh, my student got an award. It's not, you know, <laughs> you may have had something to do with it, but let them have that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so... I, I thought um, th they called me and said, listen, we have, I have an aud audition coming up. I want to work on the pieces with you. I think that's smart to call a coach that you like to work on the audition so you can do the best possible job because that is, th th that's, that's your sample case. That's what you're offering. This is what I can do. And if you, the actor, aren't sure what choices to make, why not contact a coach? A coach who has an hourly rate can have a half hourly rate if that's all you need. Or sometimes their friends, you know, what I, mean? I just, I just think it's smart, and it shows that they care, and it shows that they want to do the best they can do. That's smart. I think um, another thing that has come up because Sean mentioned, um, you know, reach, reaching out. I, I've heard. I don't know how to say this. Though, so I, I want to be careful how I phrase this. I don't want to hurt any feelings or bring up any dirt. But if you follow if you friend sean or friend me or friend don that's fine and and, and by the way if you're going to friend us in your facebook you on facebook for example and your facebook is just pictures it's the same picture of you there's three of them and that's it and i'm not going to accept that for, i don't know anything about you but if you're an actor and you're trying i don't really mind i'll friend you but then if i find out later that you've kind of just gone through all of my friends on twitter or whatever or, or instagram wherever and you've reached out saying that you know, you're a friend of Johnny Heller and you want to reach out and talk to me about maybe doing some work. You talk to an author friend of mine or a publisher friend of mine. And I find out, I will make short work of you if I can. There is a growing cadre of people who are abusing, maybe it's just using, but it sounds to me, abu it's abusive, I think, in a way. Don't, you can, ever, don't ever say that Sean Pratt sent me when Sean Pratt yeah. didn't send you. Yes, don't. that's correct. Don't. That's a don't. Yeah, don't. yeah. It's, there's, it's insulting. First of all, it's it's underhanded and it's not true. And what does that say about you as a person if that's what you did it for? You know, and and I've had a couple of instances where I've had a casting director say, "So and so contacted me, said they know you," yeah. and I'm like, I, "I said, yeah, I know them as a Facebook follow." Yeah, yeah. I don't, you know, and I'm, then I and then I get angry, and I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. still meth from him one night, but that was yeah. it. <laughs> well, haven't we all really? <laughs> um, but the, you know, the the going back to about you know hiring a coach to help with an audition, if that's the case, that's great. And some coaches do have half hour rates, 
but you know it seems almost well at least several times a month i will get an email from someone who just wants to pick my brain for 10 minutes you know 10 minutes and i'm like you know and i respond saying this is my hourly rate you know you know i'm a coach you know that that's what i provide and you want me to spend my time for free on this and i don't know you and that's not okay you know for any coach not just me or johnny or even don any coach you approach you should be willing to pay them for their time that's what they do and i get you know i just had one the other day it said yeah i got a note from someone that said i had this kind of a read and i don't know what it means so let me just i just want to borrow 10 minutes of your time <laughs> borrow my time you want to borrow my time what are you gonna pay me back? you know it's just it's an, it's like saying going to the doctor's office and saying, look i just got 10 minutes i just want 10 minutes with the doctor okay just you know because he's going to help me with this thing it's insulting well, so can, please don't do it because i allow people i let people call me for 10 15 minutes and talk to see if we should have a coaching relationship I have no, no that's problem. A, oh, see i i do a one hour oh, 45 minutes to an hour free consultation what's that oh there you yeah. go that's yeah. yeah that's different that's you know that's different than someone wanting to ask me specific questions for yeah, yeah. You know, work related stuff. No, when, when someone approaches me about wanting to work in my program, I set up an hour long time. I have a little spiel that I do sure and then I let them ask me what they want. Sorry? I'm sure you do. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. A scroll, yeah, yeah, that's right. Presentation. <laughs> How'd you know? Um, and the, uh, but that's a different thing. I'm sit and talk about the program to explain what it is I do, but it's, it's, and all, you know, I say that, you know, if I'm at a, uh, like, I was just recently in Boston at Johnny's New England retreat. And I had more than one person, you know, come down, sit next to me, or buy me a drink, or just you know, sit down over a cup of water, it doesn't matter. But we were in that environment. And that's different. You, you know, the, that's a different kind of place. But when you contact a coach out of the blue, yeah. and we're not the only ones that have experienced this. So spread the word among your colleagues, don't do that. Say, can I hire you for half an hour? Can I hire you for an hour? And yeah, I have these very specific issues I want to discuss. Yeah, I, I like to think what we've learned and, and what we have to share is worth more than a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because if not, be a if damn that's good what cup of worth, coffee. What, what have we done? <laughs> that's you know, true. I, I, and, and you think about everything we've been through, because you know, you and I came up, you know, we were actors, on, on, on stage actors, and the things we did, I mean, I, there were times when I had enough, I remember having enough money for my acting class barely my rent and no food. Mm -hmm. And and you just, I mean, those are the, uh, those are tough times and you look back and I don't look back at those as happy times. It's pain I went through, but it meant yeah. I went through it because I wanted this so badly. Right. Pain yeah. is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Yeah. You know, I went through the same, you know, it was painful to, there was a time I remember the summer of 95, uh, I was newly divorced. I was living on couches. And that summer I was, um, I was living up in Spanish Harlem on third and 99th, right across from the project. Yeah. But I got a modeling gig for a painter and she lived in Chelsea, but I had so little money. I only had enough. I only have enough money for one token a day. That was it. So I would take the train down in the morning, sit and model for her all day. And then I would walk back from Chelsea, to Spanish Harlem. And you know, you sometimes you say, oh, that's so romantic, living the life of the artist, like bullshit. Yeah, that was exhausting. I mean, yeah, it was my exercise. I, mean, I, I, made, I made it into something positive. But you know, and, and like I said, when I have a student come from a corporate background, they're not used to that kind of sacrifice, necessarily. Yeah. And they're, they really, you know, and, and it doesn't mean they're not good storytellers, that they couldn't be good pe business people, but their own frame of reference is one of, uh, I show up at the office, someone above me gives me something to do. And they want, in their mind, they're like, why can't that be, you know, once I get that job with Tantor or a random house or whatever. And I'm like, well, you know, you might get lucky and they keep you on a steady supply. But at the other side of that is even if you get that lucky, you can never settle for that because what happens if Tantor stops calling yeah. and you only had them as one client, now you're yeah. screwed. You never stop looking for clients. I have never stopped looking for new people, even after almost 30 years of doing this. Let's take some questions. Here's Jillian asking, what kind of modeling? Sean was a stand-in for Big Bird. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I modeled for a woman named Sylvia Slee, 
who is a British painter. She was in her early 80s. And uh, you may know her husband, Lawrence, oh God, what was his last name? He was the, he was the first curator of the Guggenheim Museum. And he was the guy, uh, her husband coined the term pop art back in the early 60s. Oh, wow. And so Sylvia was a painter in Chelsea and she was, and uh, I modeled for her for a variety of stuff. Closed, clothed and not clothed. That's called a tease in show business. Um, <laughs> but I will say for all those looking for those paintings, it was always very, very cold in the studio, no matter what uh, time of year it was. I'm just going to put that out there. I, I, I was a, yes. I modeled in Chicago a lot when I started. I was a, um, you know, I, I did a lot of modeling in uh, for Sears catalogs back in the day because they put me in a lazy boy because it made the chair look so much larger. <laughs> I kid you not. I, I thought you were doing like the children's catalog as a 25 year old guy. They stuck yeah, a little no. cap on you. <laughs> and and I, I did <laughs> hand modeling too for a while. But then the uh, hands get all scraped up. But yeah. Anyway, <laughs> any, hey, any questions out there from the, uh, I don't know how many people we have. Oh, uh, any specific questions for Sean, me, or Don about the world? We can, we can chat all day because these are my dear friends. I don't, I don't mind. I'm watching the chats here, and I don't see anything that uh, okay. is is. Um, so I mean, Harry was saying my resume list coaching with each of you among my training, but I never imply uh, one of you sent me. I, I do think that's just totally distasteful to tell someone else that Sean sent me or uh, Johnny sent me, yeah. and you're talking yeah. to a casting. One of the things that you there's two <laughs> things here. Number one guarantee that person is going to go back because they know those two and they know how to get a hold of mm -hmm. them and they're going to cross check yeah. that you really knew that person. Uh, number two, personal relationships in this business, like first, for example, Johnny was saying, you know, I haven't talked to Tantor in a while. The reality is he's never talked to Tantor and he never will talk to Tantor. There is a person that he has who is a contact at Tantor and there's probably two of them or four of them but or one of them. There's a couple of people and your job is to get to know who they are and then have some backups in that organization because that person could go and either do something else, then you lose that contact and then the new people, they're young, they don't know who I am. So that's one of the things, I watch Sean, I watch Johnny, they are both super, super focused on making sure that if somebody at Tantor knows them, they are building relationships beyond just the one person because it's still and always will be a relationship business, not just a, ah, I already, I had the McMillan knows me. McMillan doesn't know you. A person at McMillan knows you. And these two are masters at making sure that not only the person they're working with knows them, but they are building and actively building relationships. And I see you guys attending events that, you know, you don't have to because quote, uh, you're already known. <laughs> and what happens? They're going to events. Sean? Well, you know, oh, I, I, joined, I joined the uh, Audio Publishers Association again, the APA. I've been a member on and off for forever. I joined this year specifically to get into their speed dating. And I, I tried twice and, and didn't get in either time. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to because a, a number of years ago when I was in it, they started the speed dating. I said, I'll do it. And I did win a spot. And then... Here's me. I felt badly about taking the spot of someone who wasn't known. I just didn't feel it was right. So I gave it up to somebody, and I don't know who. And I'm thinking, why, was, why did I do that? Because um, there's a lot of new casting people who I don't know. Right. Um, I think we mentioned on the show before, Don, I had wanted badly to uh, work with Simon and & Schuster. And they were on my bucket list, and I pushed and pushed. It's been at least two years, maybe three. I remember they came up to me at one APAC, and they said, hey, uh, uh, you're John Hiller. I said, yeah, I'd like to work with you. He goes, well, you don't have time, do you? <laughs> what? That was like, that had been seven years ago. So I'm finally going to start working for him. But it took all the other, the, because of the nature of show business, it, when it comes to casting offices, there's, because of the turnover, there is really no institutional memory for the clock, for us with them. So you're right. That one person leaves, gets out of it. And now you, you're back to zero. And right. so how do you maintain, you know, so you have to look, I mean, that's, that's just one, and that's just one way of doing it. You know, one of the things I teach my students is a concept I learned as a theater actor back in the day in New York called proactive auditioning. So what I did at that time, I didn't have an agent and I wanted to do classical theater. That's all I wanted to do. 
So every year, uh, American Theater Magazine would publish the seasons for as many theaters that would submit. It was a big, thick volume of the of the magazine, and I would go through it looking for classical plays and I, with parts in them that I knew I could do. And then I would make in the old fashioned, I would cover letter, headshot, resume, and I would mail it off to as many people at that that uh, theater as possible. So I was being proactive about it. And I got auditions and I got work because of it. I didn't sit on my hands. I, I went around the casting office to get that job. Just like I've also teach my students to get around the audiobook publishers by, there's a system I teach them through proactive auditioning about how to contact the author to make the pitch directly to them. And there's a way to do it, which I think is the, you know, there's a certain way it should be done in my opinion. When the author's already connected to a publisher? Uh, well, you for a book publisher, yeah, it doesn't matter. Cause you know, not every, not every book that's published by the yeah, by yeah, Random yeah. House is gonna get turned into an audio book for I, whatever I, reason. I'll talk to you about that a little bit just because it's a, <laughs> it's a dicey situation. You could, uh, you could be stepping on some toes there, but I assume you already know. Well, you know, but yeah, I, I do. But my feeling is, you know, the, the, for the majority of books that are published will never be done into audio. Yeah. Okay. And, and not necessarily that I tell my students, oh, make sure you find an author who's got a contract with Random House. No, the majority of the ones they're looking for are either self-published yeah. or with a little tiny book publisher. You know, I, you know, I do feel this question. I, I do say to them, Look, if it's done by Random House Publishing or HarperCollins Publishing, it's going to be on the radar screen of HarperCollins Audio or Random House Audio. So the odds on that happening are much slimmer. So you should probably keep looking. That's what I tell them. Okay. You know, I don't because because you know you could like let's say Johnny, he's been publishing uh, noir murder mysteries on his own or with Don Barnes Publishing, which is a little publishing house in Sacramento or something. Okay, well, that might be a, and they've never been converted to audiobooks, and there that might be a fertile ground if you develop a relationship with the author of getting that series because Don Barnes' book publisher doesn't have the budget to do that, but Johnny and you, the the narrator, might come to an agreement that makes it work. So that's really what I'm teaching them. Yeah, I, I, yeah. just to, to cover this, I'm not like Mike said. I'm not saying don't contact authors. I'm saying be wary of going physically going around publishers to reach out to their authors with uh, that could create a problem with the publishing house that pays you that's all just just be i'm not saying don't you should contact authors all the time i don't want to be yeah. misunderstood here and there was a question from pam about can johnny uh can you say to sean johnny heller recommended me to you if i did then of course if you say to sean johnny recommended i get hold of you i promise particularly if you're really weird I, I promise Sean will go, hey, <laughs> would, you, would you send this person for us? And what person? So I, I would suggest that if you, when I would deal with a student or an actor and they say, hey, and I say, you know, it really sounds like I'd happy to work with you, but, and I do this a lot. I think you might find Sean Pratt a better match for what you're after. I have no problem with that. I, I mean, look, I'm only Sean and I, we always want to make money. There's no question about that, but we're not dying. If he thinks you would be better served with a session or two with me or Joanna Perrin or something, he'll suggest that. If I think you belong in uh, Sean's program, I'll suggest that. It's not, we want you, it's important for us, Sean, me, Don, and the people we have in the show for the most part, that the narrator community continues to be better and better and better. We all have the specter of AI on our shoulders. And it's here in a lot of ways. The best way to make sure you continue to work and not be replaced by AI is to be better, to be better actors. If working with Sean is going to make you better, I don't know, it makes you better than me, but I think it's going to, I think what you need is what Sean has. I want you to go with Sean. Yeah. I, 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 I want the end result to be better for this community. And I think we all. I, I constantly, well, you know, to me in that moment, my job is, even though that person hasn't signed on to study with me or paid me for whatever, it, once if I evaluate that person and go, I'll tell them, I'm not the right coach for you. Here are some options that think that would be the better fit. Oh, so you want to study, you know, the acting and audio books so and, you, and you really type, oh, maybe you want to go talk to Joel because he's got a program. Oh, you need some one-off coaching to get your demos recorded. Oh, maybe you want to go to Johnny Heller 
or you know Shannon Parks. Oh, you got some business life stuff to deal with. You feel like you're stuck. Oh, Anna Clements is the person for you. You know, I think we all the coaches in our, the community, most of them, we all know each other, and we we have a good grasp of what we offer. You know, so you know, and and and, and we go, no, I'm not the right person, and we constantly are referring people to each other. And, and, and I feel it's my job in that moment. That's what I, I should be doing as a good coach. And if you come to one of my Splendiferous or the New England retreats, one of my, not just a Sean Johnny show, but one of the bigger things we do, I, there's generally anywhere from seven to 10 coaches that I have with me. And you may find yourself moved by one person's style over another. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have Don Barnes and Tom Deere at New England. I have Sean Pratt and Johnny Heller. And, you know, I, I just, so you want to, I, I want you to find the right match for you that mm-hmm. makes that lets you handle what you need and makes your career choices easier that makes your career better that helps you be more professional all the time here's a question for sean from i can't read what that says Tucky. i can't read but anyway hey sean do you see that sean no sean won't be able to see it so it yeah. seems i'll read that hey sean it seems like every few days we have a new project done did i read that well uh, what's the secret for getting projects done so quickly and consistently? And I did that with a cold reading. Did you notice the feeling? No. Please answer it's the slow. question first. Get, leave, leave that alone. Yeah. So you, you get things done all the time and you put out a notice. See, this is really clever marketing. I've just released a book from Randoma. I just did finish this one for this one. People notice you seem to be getting things done. How do you, how, what's your secret for getting projects done so quickly and consistently? Um, you okay so there's two things that can there's time management and then there's focus management right so time management is when you sort of sketch out your day like i'm gonna in this block of time i'm going to record focus management is actually recording in that chunk of time i have more than one student they'll they say they're going to record during those two hours and the next thing they know they're gone down the rabbit hole of youtube or TikTok watching silly videos so part of it is focus management uh, there's some technical things that help me be fat, uh, be quicker and more efficient in the studio. Uh, I prep my the chunk of material I'm going to narrate the night before. I'll score it, you know, make notes on that little chunk because I know I'll probably end up narrating, you know, this 20 pages. Um, punch and roll, you know, I mean, I, something as basic as punch and roll makes all the difference in the world. If you, you know, that's when you're editing in real time. If you want more information about that, talk to Don. But, you know, I learned to punch and roll because I had to back in the days of, of tape when we started. There was no alternative. And so when I'm narrating, I'm, recor- I'm you know, doing those initial edits right then. Also, there comes a confidence factor. You know, I've had students who'll say they'll redo the same sentence seven times because they think they can keep doing it better. And the truth is, over time, once you get in, you know, I would challenge a lot of narrators. That's where they, they, they pull a lot of time is they keep going back and going back and redoing it. And the irony is if you're a newbie, yeah, the odds are you probably are doing it a little bit better because you're still new, but there comes a moment when your technique, you, you should be, you should start to trust the technique and know that the first take is probably going to be the best take. And that, that alone will help you start to do more. Uh, focus, you know, when I narrate, like Johnny, turn your phone off. I have no distractions and I am in it. You know, I say that I set the timer on my phone for 45 minutes. And that's all I do is record. And when the timer goes off, I get up and get a glass of water, clear my head, you know, so that when I'm in the the zone, that's what I'm focused on. Um, Also, I'm ruthless with my time. You know, they say that when you work for yourself, sometimes your boss can be a real asshole. And that's true. I hold myself to a very high standard of, you know, and not to say that I work without pause. I schedule times to go take a nap or to go stare at silly videos or whatever. But those are structured into my day. And I think that's it. It's about being very strict with yourself as your time during the day. It's the one thing you cannot buy once it's gone. Um, And then trusting, trusting the performance. I've taken Twitter off my uh, off my phone. Yeah. So I, I didn't look at it. So when I when I feel like going onto it, which is a, you know just such a minefield of hapless ass wipes, I go and. Uh, um, but it's fun. In, in the morning, 15, 20 minutes, and that's it. And I'm I'm done. You know, I, I yeah. just go in there and I belittle everyone I can possibly think of, and then get off for a while. 
But if it's on your phone, you keep you keep jumping in and looking at things and doing yeah. things. Time management is one of the most important things any of us can learn because whether you like it or not, uh, we're all actors, but you, the, we're, we're in the business. We're in business. You have to realize, like when my kids were little, so during the school day, there was a certain chunk of time when the house was quiet. So I took a chunk of it and I would record. And then, uh, you know, my wife would take the other chunk, my ex now, but she would, you know, she would have a chunk and I would have a chunk. And we were very strict about that. More than once I'd be in the middle of something and I looked down, I was like, oh, that's it. My time's up. You know, Shannon's going to get in the booth to record and that's the way it's going to be. So out, out I go. And it's still now the way I, I run my life when I, you know, like I said, it's just being strict with yourself to make that happen. Yeah. And and for a lot of people, they get distracted too easily. And that slows their time down. I, put, I write things down in my calendar. You know, if I want to go to the gym at two o'clock, I write it down. Someone says, can you do something? I, I can't do it because I've got something scheduled. Yeah. I suggest you make a schedule for yourself yeah. and adhere to it. And I'll go back the to other, Sean's. The, Sean's yeah. the, I, I need to amplify Sean's point. We have the time management that is absolutely mandatory that you have some framework to work within. And then the secondary thing that the pros do insanely well and that we all need to pay attention to is that focus management, that ability to take a chunk of time and say, I'm going to ignore everything else and be focused on a certain thing for an amount of time, even when I don't feel like it. If you, the, the, One of the things with these two guys that I absolutely see from my music background when the curtain goes up, they're performing. And if you were a theater actor, it's an eight o'clock show, a 10 o'clock, whatever time it is. And these guys would be in makeup and have their costume on and look pretty. And they would go out. And if it's eight o'clock, they're in show mode. And they understand that ability to go ahead and say, I'm focused because the lights just came on. The audience is sitting there. And they treat a lot of their life they have moments where they treat it like it was a live theater thing. And and when they're in the booth, I will tell you this. These guys have worked their craft hard enough with other, uh, with both experience and working with others long enough that they trust their performance. So if you're doing seven takes, what does that mean? That means I'm second guessing my performance. And I haven't done enough rehearsal or coaching or had enough background so that I can trust myself. And if you go to these two guys and you spend some time with them, and there's plenty of other great coaches too, but when you do that, you become confident enough that you want to go in the booth. And a lot of times that first performance is gold or the best of the options that I'm going to get for that day. The others could be different. Know, go ahead, Sean. I know that Johnny can speak to this, too, is that Johnny and I come from a live performance background with theater. And Johnny also did stand up. And when the curtain goes up, that's it. So if Johnny and I are doing a play and we get to our scene and we get some laughs and if it a couple we don't get, we have to wait till the next night to do that. And if we're smart, we might go rehearse it before the scene, but there is no backing up. And the, cha the, the problem for a lot of, I forgot the person who asked the question, but because of the technology, you can do 75 takes if you want, but you know, and because you can just keep back up and do it. It's like when you work with a, an experienced film director and you have to do the scene where you walk in the door and sit in the chair 25 freaking times because they don't know what they want and they want to get coverage. And when you come from a live performance background, you don't get that luxury. So you're forced to learn to trust your instincts. And then over enough time, you build the confidence. So like if Johnny's trying out new material as a standup, you know, maybe of the five, his tight five, you know, a couple of jokes don't land and he goes back and works them. He can't stop in the moment and tell the joke again. He has to wait and learn. And so I push a lot of yeah, my students. Yeah. So, so like I had a student once who came to me when he came to me, uh, when we ended our interview, I said, so what are you working on now? He said, well, I've been recording this book about, uh, the life of Socrates. And I said, well, how long is it? He said, it's a six hour book. I said, how long have you been doing it? Three months. Cause he would record a chapter, think I can do it again. And he would just keep recording the book. And I told him, I said, you weren't allowed to work with me until you published that book. And then from now on, I mean, sometimes I do this. I make my students share their production calendar with me to say, okay, this book is only six hours long. You get exactly X number of days to get it done. Regardless, do it. Because that's also a mark about becoming, as we can all testify, Johnny and I, a professional in the sense that you're going to get, you might have an opportunity to get a drop-in book, which could set your course 
you know, now you're working with Random House and they need it though in, you know, a week and a half. And if you've taken the luxury of taking a month for every book, suddenly you're going to freak out. So my advice is always pretend the book is on a tighter deadline than you think. And you will learn to get streamlined. You will force yourself to trust it, trust your own process, you, you'll and you will become known. faster. You also get known as someone who turns in things on time or early. On time. Yeah. I've, I've never been late on a project ever, ever. And I don't ever intend to be. I, I've, I've, I know we're I know wrapping soon, but I have a question or a thought just yeah. came to me. You know when you audition for a voiceover commercial stuff, and or even on-camera stuff, sometimes you do two takes, sometimes three if you get to. Because you, you, it's a it's a commercial, it's a thirty second you know, read or something. Right. I have not done this, but when I do, I'm going to try. I'm going to I'm going to talk to a couple of publishers, and I'll come back with one of our Don and Johnny shows and and tell you what they think. But I want your take on this, Sean. Just curious. I just thought about it. What if you get an audition? Okay, here's Dreamscape. Here's Penguin. Whoever. Here's an audition. Here's what they want. It's a five minute bit, four minute read, whatever it is. One of you said, take one, Here's our, and then you do what you think they want. And then, like I do in auditions, here's take two. Here's, an, here's how I want to do it, or something, you know? I wonder, I just wonder if that's a good call, and I don't know if it is or not. I don't know if the publishers or the auditioners, as I think about, would have time to listen to two takes from everybody. They probably Yeah, I, I think it's more of a time issue, but also, I'll be frank with you. Yeah, you're right, and so the first one will be the one they focus on. You know, it's been my experience... Uh, the, even if the author gives you some kind of direction, usually they don't know how to communicate with us. They don't yeah. know our language. Yeah. And oftentimes with the publisher, there isn't. I mean, it's like, here's the dust jacket description of the project. Here's the timeline. Here's the audition piece. Yeah. Take it. And so what I do is, you know, as Johnny can testify, there's nothing worse than a nice audition. That's death. Because a nice audition is forgettable. So, you know, I, I look at the text, I make a choice, and I make a strong choice. That doesn't mean that I'm like yelling in the mic. I mean, a strong choice, like, here's my point of view, or if you hire me, this is my, this is the thing I'm doing. And every once in a while, I might get a call back and they say, can you try this instead? And I'm like, sure, I'll do that, but I'll commit. It's about committing, committing to the choice. Yeah. Don't yeah. just, cause, cause they're going to get a ton where they just, people just read. And that's only one step away from AI. Because those people were told they have a nice voice. Yeah. 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 So here's my nice voice. <laughs> yep, and I'm I, the the funny thing is, I sat in the pit orchestra for theater productions and doing that and watching, and and people got director's notes at the end, which meant that, yes, Johnny had a performance where he waited too long or he was too quick or he was too this. They'd give him notes at the end, and he'd fix it the next night. But that next night, whatever he did was what he did, and he would do it to the max that he could totally do it with what he thought the director wanted, and it was a constant refinement process over the whole show. Every night it was a little different. Every night it got better. What I absolutely can guarantee you for the people in the audience, these two trust themselves because they've done their homework. They are not winging it, and this is the first their first rodeo. They actually practice and they practice and get feedback from others and can constantly refine. And I just don't know anybody in the business, uh, there's like a, a few dozen like you guys, where not only are you amazing at the craft, but you understand that it's a people business, you understand it's a relationship business, and you farm the business aspect of it, the, the, the acting aspect of it, and put it all together in a package where you then package relationships into that and it's amazing what comes out for people that constantly work that. And I don't care what business you're in. These principles are universal that Sean teaches and Johnny teaches. And people, watch what people they want. Go ahead. People want to be excellent. They want to be the best. And I, obviously, you want to do the best. But you know, excellence is not a one-off thing. Excellence is a habit. Right. And as you do the little things, so you do the big things. So if you're you know, if you're not trying, you know, pursue excellence in your, in your admin, admin work. Pursue excellence in your networking technique for an elevator pitch. Do you know the same amount of effort you want in do, your ability to do a French accent or to do science fiction material? Bring that sense of excellence to how you handle your calendar every given day, how you manage your focus, how you manage your mental health. You 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 can't be you cannot say I want to be excellent, but only in this part of my life. The rest of my part of my life, 
is just a nightmare of just craziness. Right. It's a it's a it's a whole it's a it's an organic and holistic approach to living your life as a freelancer. Okay. Let, it has let, to. Let me, let me wrap up because I'm gonna throw out a couple commercials for us. Uh, Sean and, and Anna Clement will be at a, a Mavo uh, Mid Atlantic Voiceover. I think it's next week. Yes. Well, well, this week. This I week. leave on Thursday. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There may be some tickets left. That's up uh, outside Washington D.C. near Dulles Airport. There, it's a wonderful thing. Um, uh, if, if you're interested, please contact me. I can send you the link. Yeah. Um, and Paul Rubin and I will, if you're in New York City, we'll be redoing our uh, audiobook intensive acting workshop at Open Jar Studios on December 10th. It's a Sunday. Uh, you can see it on Facebook. Go to my website, johnnyheller.com, under workshops. You'll see it. Um, and uh, and one final, Joanna Perrin and I are offering a two-for-one kind of a coaching thing. So instead of our normal price for $300, you get an hour with Joanna and an hour with me. You have to pay by the end of the year, but you can use it throughout the year. So just um, yeah, letting that's... you know what's coming up. And just go to Sean's website, my website, Don's website, and you'll find out all this stuff. But uh, yep. we're here and we're available. And, and I think that's what you need to go in. And Sean is eminently quotable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's everything you say has little quotes around it. I don't know why you're not. Everything you say, good morning, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> And don't what forget, so these guys, that? these guys, so I, I just, I, I have to say, because they're too humble to say it. I'm around a lot of really good coaches because I attend, they, I get invited to, to, to coach alongside of them. I'm kind of the outsider because they're always, always doing all the acting things and the, and I just never run across too many people that understand the bigger picture about this business at the level that you two do. There's a few others, but most people don't put the whole package together they do think, wow, I'll do nonfiction because it doesn't require acting or whatever. And they don't take the whole business seriously. And uh, you two are brilliant at that. You know, real happy you were here today. Sean, be sure to get me your, the links. I'll put them in the show notes so that people can find links to things from for that we talked about here in the show notes on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to turn on notifications. Johnny and I are doing this each week. We will also invite back Sean in the next year uh, at different intervals to talk about his latest projects and how he's helping more and more and more people succeed. One of the things they get as a final wrap up, they not only see people succeed, but they see people ignore good advice and not succeed. <laughs> so just because they've coached with Johnny, just because they've coached with Sean does not make them great in the business because unfortunately as a coach, we see this all the time. You give great advice to somebody, you give great direction to somebody, and then they don't do it. And it's frustrating. It's all heck, oh, right? I mean, so we didn't talk about maddening. that today, but it's maddening where you give somebody great advice and they just kind of whatever they for whatever the reason is that life comes up, they don't implement it. So I will say these are excellent people. And they are constantly working on their game. And I'm I'm always inspired to be around them. I'm proud to know them and work with them. And we look forward to next week seeing you with the Heller Barnes Ask Us Anything. We'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.